morning, everybody. Thank you for joining the ACA Small Business Food Camp on this Tuesday, August 3rd. Can't believe it's August already. I'm uh, Robert Theobald, Small Business Ombudsman and Vice President of Small Business Services here at the Arizona Commerce Authority, and uh, I'd like to welcome everybody. I would like to start by first thanking all of our community partners. We could not do these boot camp sessions without their time, their talent, their expertise, and their effort. Uh, they are great partners of ours and we appreciate them very much. So for those who are not familiar, the Small Business Boot Camp is designed to help small businesses return from COVID crisis stronger than ever. It is a statewide initiative supported by all our community partners, such as today with one of our community partners, Local First. And not only is it a, a boot camp, but it is a resource collective and a content library. So on the boot camp website, you went there to register for today's upcoming session. Um, and you can see the, the upcoming sessions as well on that page. Um, and then if you scroll down a bit, you'll find the Resource Collective. And the Resource Collective is a set of tools provided by our community partners to help support small businesses. Additionally, as I mentioned, you have the Content Library. One of the uh, unintended but very positive things that came from this uh, webinar series is that we record every session and thus it created a massive content library of expert uh, presentations and content and training. So on the archive section at the very bottom of our website, you'll find over 140 different webinars that we've done over the last 64 weeks. And you can access those uh, anytime you need to. There's no cost to, to view them. And you can view the, the webinar. You can download the materials that were part of it. Uh, and so it was a great resource available to everyone. Additionally, the uh, state has a couple websites that are very important. First is the state's uh, COVID-19 information and resource website, ArizonaTogether.org. And then the Arizona Commerce Authority set up a COVID-19 business resources website at azcommerce.com forward slash COVID-19. And on that website, you can find some additional operational guidance. You can find funding um, opportunities, whether they're grants or loans or other information related to some of the funding out there at the local, state, and federal level. Um, a lot of great information available on that website. The ACA also has a number of programs to help support small businesses, our small business services, our workforce, and our Arizona MEP, our Manufacturing Extension Partnership. All those programs help support small businesses across the state uh, with various different programs. Sorry about that, computers act a little slow. So another program that we have that uh, is out there for, for everybody to access that, that needs it is a small business checklist. And the checklist is designed to help small businesses or those looking to start a small business or expand into different uh, industries or product lines to understand the commonly requested licensing or registration and compliance needs at the local, state and federal level. Um, you can also find additional information on business planning and marketing and procurement and, and other topics on that checklist as well. With that, we want to jump into some business updates. So starting tomorrow, the SBA should have a PPP loan forgiveness portal open. They're working on it. They gave us August 4th as the date that that should launch. That portal is going to make it easier for businesses that have loans of $150,000 or less apply for PPP loan forgiveness. Um, they're finding that the majority of the outstanding PPP loans are loans in that category. And so it'll help apply directly through that. Uh, your lender has to opt into that program, um, but it should still make it easier to apply for forgiveness. We will have more details as that program actually opens up and rolls out, um, but we want to make everybody aware of it. Also, another good resource that we talked about last week on our tax credit session is the employee retention credit. Um, please get with your accountant and find out more about that, but it is an option or an opportunity for significant funding for many businesses. Also, the EIDL targeted advance is still open to the eligible businesses. We will post a link in the chat 
for that uh, website so you can identify if you are an eligible business to apply for additional EIDL funding um, for your business. And then the last note, if you're a tech startup, uh, the Arizona Innovation Challenge applications are open. Um, so you can take a look at that. We'll post the link in the chat as well. So with that, we're gonna take a quick look at uh, this week's sessions and next week's sessions. So today we have our profit strategies for your restaurant. On Thursday, we have a, our first of a series of three HR um, webinars in partnership with the Society of Human Resource Management. Uh, so it's small business HR compliance. And then next Tuesday, we have operational excellence, customer service as a differentiating factor. And then our second on HR strategies to engage today's workforce. So we got a number of great sessions coming up. We hope you can join us for those. But for now, we're gonna go ahead and turn the time over to Gabe Gardner. He's the director of food programs at Local First Arizona. And as you can see in his bio there, that he is a food expert. So we uh, are looking forward to his presentation today and uh, see how we can gain more uh, profitability in our food businesses. All right. Thanks, Robert. Um, glad to be here and uh, happy to be part of uh, that fantastic um, online collective. I <clears throat> was talking with some of the businesses that we incubate uh, in, a, in a meeting and I brought up the, the whole archive and what a laundry list of information. Um, chances are if you're a small business and you've got a question, it's been covered at some point in the last, what, 141 sessions that you all have done. So. Thank you for doing that for businesses and uh, for allowing me to be a part. So um, without further ado, I'll go ahead and share my screen. And as Robert mentioned, um, I'm going to be talking about uh, bottom line strategies, lowering costs, and increasing profits uh, in our restaurants. And I will say that <clears throat> although uh, my career and background certainly is focused on food and um, food initiatives and restaurants and so forth, a lot of this stuff um, translates across um, industry. So um, the bottom line for today is if you don't know your numbers, you don't really know your business. And so as I thought about this and what we were going to talk about and what I wanted to cover, I really feel that this is at the core of, of everything. And so um, if it's one thing to be able to compute all of the numbers that uh, a business kind of accumulates and, and this data that we gather. Um, and there's a lot of great, um, you know, uh, 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 programs, technology, you know, whether it be a, a square reader or a, a, a POS system or any, you know, an Excel spreadsheet, but, and it will aggregate all of that data for you. Um, but understanding what it means in relationship to the daily operation, that's the trick. Right. If I just say 37 percent, well, 30 percent percent of what? If you say 37 percent food cost, that's great. But 37 percent food cost um, doesn't mean anything if if you don't have an understanding that most restaurants should be operating at 30 percent or less food cost if the intent is to generate some sort of profit. So. Um, the basic business formula, which is, but should have been pounded into the head of most anyone who is running a business, um, certainly was when I was in hotel school, um, revenue minus expense equals profit, right? So what we brought in versus what we spent leaves us what we've got left over, which in theory is profit, right? That profit can become dividends to the owners. It can be a means to reinvest back in the business, right? Um, so how do we increase profit if this is our formula? Well, we either increase revenue, right? And hold expenses, which is difficult to do um, <clears throat> because when we increase revenue, chances are we're increasing um, in a restaurant setting guests and more guests mean that you've got to buy more raw product, more food coming in the back door, right? So it's hard to hold those expenses, right? Usually revenue and expense kind of move together. Um, the other thing that you can do is hold revenue, meaning the same amount of guests coming into the dining room and decrease expenses, right? So moving to um, 
a cheaper supplier for high ticket items like, like protein um, or uh, eliminating waste in some capacity or utilizing trim, right? So carrots and onion skins become stock, which becomes soup, that kind of stuff. So those are the traditional ways. I will say the second one is usually a little bit easier from a managerial perspective to achieve. So if we have this traditional uh, formula, um, does this hold up? Well, <clears throat> yes, right? You, you can still attack business that, that traditional way, right? Revenue minus expenses equals profit. But to offer a different perspective, if we you know, shuffle the deck, so to speak, um, and we have revenue minus profit gives us expense. So what we brought in minus what type of, the amount of profit that we need gives us what's left for expenses. What this does is it promotes budgeting. It, it promotes attention to the expenses themselves. And it also promotes paying yourself first. Um, which is not, not always the, the most common practice in particularly in restaurants, but in, in small business across the board. And so if the, what your intent to do with the profit is to take 10% of profit and put it away in a savings account to, I don't know, refurbish the dining room, right? And then the other um, piece of the profit is to pay yourself a salary. This gets you there um, kind of uh, more readily. And that's not to say that there won't be unexpected expenses that come up, right? A fryer breaks down or refrigerators on the fritz, whatever. Um, but this kind of puts you in a better uh, way to do that. So um, what are these types of costs? Well, there's direct costs and indirect costs. So direct costs are, are pretty easy to understand. They're the things you pay outright for, right? So food, food costs, portion sizes, food waste, these all relate to that. Um, rent that you would pay or uh, for a leased space or booth rental or farmer's market, these are all direct costs. Indirect costs are things that you pay for that aren't ingredients, but um, certainly add to the experience that the guest is having. So these may be um, costs that you pay for once uh, or, or at least not for a long period of time. So if you think about decor in a dining room, ambiance, lighting, that type of stuff, right? All very important things, right? But it's not the potatoes that become the French fries on the plate. Um, there's overhead expenses. So it could be utilities, you know, gas, electric, water. Um, it could be paying a firm to help with marketing um, or to do social media outreach if you're not taking that on yourself. And then we wind up uh, looking lastly at labor expenses, which um, are equal, if not more oftentimes than the raw food cost, the inputs that way. Um, and these costs are a little bit, um, you've got a lot more control over it, right? So I'll talk about this in a moment, but food costs across a month fluctuate a lot, right? Um, the cost of carrots or strawberries or chicken might go up uh, or down. Um, labor costs, you're paying an hourly employee anyway, the same wage all the time. So you can control how much or how little they're in the restaurant. Um, if you do have a very labor intensive dish um, and it, the labor's killing you, maybe is that dish worth it, right? If that dish is a profit generator and it's kind of the, the hallmark of your business, then that's something you have to keep. If it's a dish that's terribly labor intensive, but you're not selling a lot of it, you know, nothing should be sacred, right? If it's gonna save you in labor to take it off the menu, then I would do so. Um, what can affect these costs? Well, food costs, like I just mentioned, right? So the cost of um, a commodity like chicken going up or down. Um, and then service costs, right? So what I would say about service costs is this directly ties to labor, think about what the customer's expectation is and what their experience is in the dining room. So um, the experience that I have when I go to the little taqueria that's, you know, half a mile from my house, and I spend $9 and then I get, you know, enough food for an army is very different than if it's my anniversary and my wife and I go out to a, a fine dining steakhouse, right? Both of those meals are 
fantastic, right? But they're very different. And so the amount of service needed and expected from the guest point of view at those two restaurants, is, it's just different. And so the labor associated with those two things is quite different. I'll also say at the fancy steakhouse, you know, if we go out and we spend mercy $250 on dinner, well, that price is commensurate with the level of service. And so they're generating more revenue, but they also have a lot more labor costs, right? They might have three or four people doting over our table all night. So, whereas at the, the counter service, the, the taqueria, you know, it's, I, I go up, I, I give them my order and then they yell out number 15, you know, in about three minutes and I get my food and I sit down. So um, both great meals, but just very different in service. Um, pricing boundaries. <clears throat> so um, another thing that can affect our costs is this idea of pricing boundaries. And so that is knowing what you can charge for something and where your, your hard stops are. So if you have a steak on your menu uh, and your entrees are priced between 15 and $25, that steak, because it's a higher price item, meaning that it costs you physically more, is probably gonna be on the $25 end, right? The pasta primavera dish, which is you know linguine and olive oil and garlic and fresh vegetables is probably gonna be on the $15 end. What you're trying to do is across the menu mix, right? The mix of things that folks are buying in the restaurant, you're trying to create or, or hit a target food cost, right? There's, you're going to make less money on the steak because it's costing you more. You're gonna make a lot more money, re revenue anyway, on the pasta dish because your inputs are cheap. But the hope is that on average, you're doing well, right? You may well sell more steaks than you sell pasta dishes that's okay because they balance each other out in the end. Um, the other thing that I would suggest is look at what the market will pay, right? So if you're, um, where are you located within the region, of the, the city, the state, the town, right? Um, so what someone will pay for um, a burrito in, North Scottsdale is different than they'll pay for a burrito in Cottonwood, right? Again, neither one's right, neither one's wrong, but where are you and what can the market bear? Um, okay, so if we look at expense control, so every expense dollar saved becomes a dollar of profit. So if, you, if that's your mantra going into this, where can I control expenses? Um, realizing that if you save $1, that's you know one more dollar in your pocket, so to speak. So food cost um, and cost of goods sold, which is you know food cost and cost of goods sold are almost synonymous um, or interchangeable in restaurant speak. So <clears throat> a million years ago when I was in culinary school, it was beat into my head that a typical, typical restaurant, as if there is one, and maybe at that time there was a typical restaurant, but it's 30% food cost, 30% labor, 30% overhead, which leaves you with about 10% profit, right? And so if you can drop your food cost from 30% to 28%, that gives you another 2% in profit, which might not sound like a, a big deal, but if you're looking at a $2 million restaurant, that extra 2% is, you know, that could be, that could be you know, your salary. So, um, the cost of goods sold or food cost should be at 33, or I would even suggest 30 or less. Labor cost, um, 35 or less. Again, 30, 30, 30, 10 is really great. Um, and then prime cost, which is the materials, food, and labor, the folks needed to produce and serve the food should be 60% or less. If you can make those numbers fit, you should be doing pretty well. But then there's all sorts of other things to consider, right? What's the facility cost? Um, if you can be creative about that facility cost, right? So if you're a caterer and you don't need a physical dining room because you're going out and doing events, um, maybe you could share a space with another caterer or a baker or a, a, you, know, you could pay a restaurant to come in and work you know, from six in the morning until three in the afternoon. And then because they're only open for dinner, right? You can be creative with that facility cost. 
uh, and don't be afraid to kind of step out of the normal boundaries of this is our kitchen and we have to have it this way. Um, utility incentives, which are certainly out there. Can you take those credit card processing fees, particularly uh, in the day and age of uh, Uber Eats and, and Postmates um, and push them to your customer? Can you talk to your insurance agent and see if you can save some dollars there? Um, and continually look at expenses and look for savings, right? Uh, one of the things that I counsel small businesses to do um, often is to look at things objectively. Just because something is the way that it is currently doesn't mean that it is working. It doesn't mean that it has to remain that way. And it doesn't mean that it will always be that way. If something started and, and it was great during the first two years of operation, but now you're in year three and it's a process that doesn't work, don't be afraid to change it to one that does particularly if, the, if it's going to, to help with your expenses. Um, so this is a, a formula that outlines um, how to get to this cost of goods sold um, or food cost, the raw figure of food cost. And so we've got opening inventory purchases um, and then uh, we've, we've got the closing inventory. I always bring this up because this points out to us, if you're not taking regular inventory and keeping track of the data, meaning the inputs in the back door, right, the raw food, um, and what is left at the end of an accounting period, in this case, it looks like a month, then you're missing a big piece of the puzzle. And that sentence that I said, if you don't know your numbers, you don't know your business. It's impossible to know the business if you don't know these figures. So. Uh, if you don't have, oh, if you don't have uh, an accounting process in place, then I would start one. It's, it's not terribly difficult to set up a spreadsheet and to keep track of what you're buying um, and then you know what you've got left at the end of any particular period. <clears throat> so how do we generate uh, revenue or profit, right? So revenue is, is the money generated by its income and profit is hope is the money that we're hopefully getting to keep um, or becomes you know back into the investment of the business so analyze all product costs uh, to use the ones that will not compromise quality but will control expense so if you're working with um oh what's a decent example uh you're you're working with a farm and you're bringing in beautiful organic you know locally uh raised or like locally grown produce right for the dishes that um that makes sense meaning dishes that are um kind of the the centerpiece of the guest experience right so if they have really fantastic greens and you're making these beautiful salads and like fresh tomatoes and maybe they're also bringing you like cheese that they make on the farm and that goes into the salad and you can charge top dollar based on the fact that it's local and it's organic and and it's you know the taste is out of this world go for it right that generates revenue if you're also buying onions from them to put into a stock a chicken stock and the onions are costing you an arm and a leg, I doubt at the end of the day, anyone's going to know whether or not, like you can't taste chicken soup and go, well, those onions are, are organic and they came from a farm down the road, right? So maybe the onions come from a broadline purveyor like Shamrock, who still does a tremendous amount of stuff locally based, right? Um, but kind of the, the flagship and the, the key items in that salad are coming from the small local farm, right? Um, <clears throat> look at your labor procedures, right? Is there any way that you can cut profit there? Look at your menu. If it's too big, if it requires too much inventory, too much storage, if there's things that aren't selling, um, you know, it, it physically the way the menu is uh, laid out, does it hide the things that you make a lot of profit on? Well, change it. Um, and it, I, I would challenge you to find an objective third party in that. A lot of times as business owners, we work really hard, um, so hard in the day to day that we get caught up um, in that day to day. And it's hard to work on the business because you're working in the business day to day. 
and um, your passion and your heart is tied up in that particular menu item. By giving it to someone, uh, an objective person, whether it be another business owner, another restaurateur, uh, someone at, at, at the Commerce Authority or someone at Local First, right? Um, then we're able to kind of look at that without all the emotion attached to it. Fill the kitchen, which we talked about, looking at some, um, some different methods about how to uh, facilitate and um, work out having a space in which to cook, right? So maybe if you are a full service restaurant, dining room with a whole bit, maybe bringing in some people that are food truck operators, right? It's passive income. Um, and then aggressively target that takeout menu. If the pandemic has taught restaurateurs nothing else, it's that people have, there's an appetite, no pun intended, um, for takeout, right? And so I don't think that the third party delivery apps and customers desire to get great food and bring it home is going to, to go away. I think it might ebb and flow, but I think that's now expected. Um, a great way that you can uh, boost revenue is by putting drinks into the mix, right? Drinks are low cost, they're low labor cost, they're low food cost, um, and the markup on them is really great, right? So, all right, so food cost, which um, we've talked about, but I guess it bears uh, looking at uh, you know a technical definition. It's the actual dollar value of food used in a food service operation, right? More accurately, it's the cost of food sold to customers um, and the value of anything that's wasted or lost through shrink. So shrink could be things like giving um, employee meals or comp to dinners, that kind of stuff, right? Theft, you know, um, I don't like to talk about it, but certainly it does happen in restaurants. So if food cost is of paramount importance, what can we do to control those costs? Well, the first thing is menu planning. So menu planning can be some or all of these things if they're applicable to your operation. So cross utilization, cross utilization is simply the idea of using an ingredient in more than one dish. If, excuse me, um, if you've got uh, mushrooms, right? So let's say as an appetizer, you've got like a roasted uh, mushroom and garlic flatbread, right? With like Asiago cheese. And you're like, man, this is the best damn thing we got going, right? And so you're bringing in all these fancy mushrooms. You're bringing in like uh, pink oyster mushrooms and shiitake mushrooms and, and mayatake and all sorts of stuff, right? You're doing this really beautiful mix of all these wild mushrooms. Maybe you're getting them from, from um, Magic Mike at Southwest Mushroom or something. Anyway, <clears throat> you're doing all this really great stuff for this particular appetizer. And the restaurant industry being a fickle one, it just, it, it doesn't sell that week. Who knows why, you know, the, the sun is up, the clouds are out, it rained, uh, I don't know, my car is silver. I don't know why, but it, it didn't sell. If you don't have another way to use those mushrooms, they're sitting in the refrigerator doing a couple things. One, they're taking up space. Two, they're deteriorating and going bad. And three, they eventually are headed towards waste, right? Which certainly does not help our, our revenue nor our profit. So if we take that idea of, yes, you have this fantastic appetizer, flatbread and mushroom thing, but then maybe you also roast some of those mushrooms and they go onto that salad I was talking about earlier with the local greens and some goat cheese. And then also they become an upcharge for that steak that we talked about earlier, right? So you got a $25 steak, but for an additional $4, you can have beautiful you know, garlic roasted mushrooms. That suddenly the $25 steak becomes a $29 steak one. Right, and you don't have to do anything other than you're already processing the mushrooms, cutting them up for the flatbread, right, and the salad. And now all of a sudden, shoot, let's, yeah, let's add those mushrooms, right? So that's cross utilization. <clears throat> um, portion size and portion control. Uh, this has been uh, harped on to me personally since my first job when I was doing. <laughs> 15 was my first kitchen job. 13, I started washing dishes and 15 was my first like, 
here guys, scoop the potatoes. Um, and it's gotta be the same every single time for two, two reasons, one consistency, right? If I go into that taqueria by my house and I order four street tacos and one week they put in two ounces of meat on those tacos and the next week they put in one ounce of meat, I'm gonna know and I'm gonna say, well, what happened? Last week, these things were gigantic, huge, great. And this week I feel like, you know, I'm getting ripped off. The other thing is by using portion control devices, and it can be something as simple as, you know, a portion scoop um, for, for the meat on the tacos, it keeps your costs in line, right? If you know that two ounces goes on every single taco, you know how much to order. You also know what the exact cost of one taco is, you know, as it's going out, right? One chicken taco costs this, costs us this much. So we need to charge X in order to generate profit. Using all edible trim, <clears throat> which in fancy food circles is called nose to tail eating. Um, this is probably a holdover from when I taught at culinary schools, but um, that's just simply using everything, right? So if you have onion peels, maybe those are what wind up in the stock for the chicken stock for the chicken soup. And you're using the onions on the fajita dish, right? Um, you know, taking the bones from the chickens that you're, that you're processing and making chicken stock, right? That's using it all. Plan production to avoid leftovers. Um, so uh, that's setting up your menu and, and prepping in a way that doesn't generate leftovers. If you do have leftovers, turn them into something else. So baked potatoes become home fries the next day at breakfast. Um, and then order things like imperishable items, <clears throat> order things that are perishable in small batches like fresh herbs, right? That will lower the amount of waste that we have. Um, all right, so a little turned around here. So um, food cost percentage. So as I mentioned, um, food cost percentage should hover around 30% in most restaurants, um, but it could be substantially lower. So if you're a, a coffee cart, right? Or a, a, a paleta cart, then um, it will probably be much less. <clears throat> Your other expenses like um, gas and insurance to pull that cart around from place to place may be substantially higher. So how do we calculate this? Well, to figure out our percentage, um, it's really that same formula that we talked about at the very beginning, but it's percentage, right? So if we have an ideal food cost percentage is the food cost, what did it cost us to buy the food divided by the menu price? Now that only works if you currently know what your menu price should be. Another way to do that is this. What do we pay for food, cost of goods sold, divided by the, the revenue generated, the sales, gives us a percentage, right? There it is in actuality. We spent 7,000 this month on food. We generated $25,000 in sales. It's a 28% food cost. Now that 30% that I mentioned on this slide, like that's a ballpark. And so if you're, run, if you're, you're operating that fancy high-end steakhouse that I talked about, chances are your food cost is gonna be more, right? Um, but if, if you're operating the, the, the coffee truck, maybe less. So don't say 30%, my God, it's gotta be 30% or lower all the time, right? Um, but there are ways in which we can lower that number, which I think we've gone through. So in food cost percentage, A divided by B equals C, right? To kind of belabor this point a bit more. The question is what happens to C, which is our food cost percentage, if A or B changes, right? So the price of strawberries skyrockets, right? That's the cost going up, or our sales dramatically drop, or vice versa, the uh, price of strawberries goes down, that would be great, and our sales go up, that would be fantastic, our food cost percentage grows, or goes down rather, right? Which in theory generates more profit for us as, as owner operators. So um, there's a lot of variables in A and B. A lot of things can happen in the restaurant industry to change this type of stuff. Um, so that's why 
again, coming back to that inventory and looking at things objectively, keeping good records and looking at it on a um, consistent basis. Just having your, your uh, point of sale system generate figures for you doesn't mean anything if they're just gonna sit in a pile on the desk, right? So you've really got to look at them and say, well, what is this information telling me about where my business is and where we're headed? So going back and looking at those objectively. Um, so <clears throat> I get asked this in working with small businesses probably four or five times a week. Um, and it's, what do I charge for the thing that I've got? Right, I'm selling these tacos. Well, my, this is what I'm selling them for, for $2 a piece. Is that the right price? I, you know, I don't know until we dig into the figures. Um, so one way to figure out menu price is by looking at uh, an ideal food cost percentage. So 28%, right? And then you've got to figure out the raw food cost of the item, <clears throat> which means if you're doing, um, Al Pastor tacos, and you're starting with a 10 pound pork shoulder, right? And you're cutting it and marinating it and roasting it and the whole thing. And then, right? And then you need to start with 10 pounds of pork down to a two ounce portion on the taco. There's a lot of division in between those two things. It can be done, right? But you've still got to work on it all the way through from 10 pounds all the way down, right? To figure out what does it cost me for one taco? Um, and then, so price would equal, what did it cost to create one taco, right? So the onions, the cilantro, the tortilla, the marinade, the pork, the garlic, this, all of it, right? Um, divided by that percentage will give you a price. So I think I have, yeah, here we go. So if we have $4 in raw food cost for something, uh, let's say a, a grilled salmon plate with uh, wild rice and asparagus. There's $4 in our cost on that plate. 28% is our ideal food cost. If you do the calculation, the menu price would be $14.29. What I'll say about that $14.29 is in a place that is serving grilled salmon with wild rice and roasted asparagus, you're not gonna have $14.29 on the menu, right? What are you going to do? You're probably going to round it up to 15 bucks, right? Um, you would never round it down to 14. So um, bring it to $15 and, and call it a day. Now that said, which I think I talk about, um, <clears throat> this comes back again to what will the market bear? So I always tell this story about, I work with a, a, a small pop-up business and she does Cajun food. Uh, around the valley and I saw her at two different farmers markets and she was doing a shrimp po' boy and um, <laughs> I'll not mention the two markets so that you don't figure it out but um, she was at one farmers market in the East Valley charging one price and then she was at a different farmers market in a different part of the valley charging two dollars more right and um, it didn't bother me. It was, the, the food's delicious and I'm willing to pay for it, right? And I happened to visit her at both of these farmer's markets. And I went up to her and I said, hey, well, you know, what's the deal with that? She said, well, when I'm at this market, I, just, I know I can charge more and I get it consistently and my sales are steady. That's being observant of the market, what it will bear and realizing that the customer base at that particular farmer's market has more expendable income or is willing to pay more or values the product, whatever it is, right? Whatever the variables are, she consistently was selling out of the sandwich at both markets, right? But she can get away with charging two bucks more at this market, right? That's not to say that she's not making profit at the market where she's charging $2 less or she should stop doing that market altogether, right? She's still generating profit. It's just a couple bucks more per sandwich at this one, right? So yes, do the math, right? Figure this stuff out. But then ask yourself, where are we? What is our customer? You know, who is our target customer? Which starts to get into marketing, which is far beyond the scope of what we're talking about today. Um, and what does our customer want? What are they demanding? And what can, can we charge and still be successful? All right, <clears throat> so recipes as a tool um, to, to hone in and tighten up our food cost. 
recipe is merely a written record um, of the ingredients of prep preparation steps needed for a dish. And um, some of the things that will affect this, measuring things accurately, using the right unit of measure, so a, a dozen uh, each, a bunch, right, a, a bunch of cilantro. Um, and then I would say that standardizing recipes for efficiency for both portion size and food cost and, and, and consistency you know, in the dining room, all of those things are important as far as standardized recipes go. Um, standardized recipe is exactly what it sounds like. Um, it's, it's taking a recipe and it may have some of these, it may have all of these, um, but these are some things to think about when um, standardizing a recipe. And I'll say, as you grow your business and you start to bring on employees, this is more and more difficult. Um, if you are that, that uh, taqueria and you're starting with, with, you know, Nana's recipe for the al pastor, you may know it by heart and it comes out perfect every single time. And you can do it by, by touch and by taste and, and kind of, you know, um, but you've been making that recipe your whole life. And now you've hired someone to make this recipe and it's still got to meet the quality requirements. It's still got to make meet the pricing requirements, the portion requirements, the guest demand, right? And it's gotta be the same every single time. So a standardized recipe like this gets us there. So <clears throat> most restaurants, particularly once they start bringing on employees have got a three ring, three ring binder somewhere that has all these uh, standardized recipes in it. And if you notice that the standardized recipes that you already have aren't being followed, then that becomes um, a moment of truth managerially speaking, where you can say, we've got these recipes. This is how we generate revenue. It's how we generate profit. And ultimately it's how we continue to meet payroll every two weeks. So we've got to get back to this. Just because this exists does not mean that your employees are following it. Um, and if it's been a while since you've had a refresher with them, maybe it's time to have a refresher, right? Because they might think, well, gosh, you know, I really, I love this, this El Pastor, but it needs more oregano, right? And they're throwing in extra oregano. Well, that's not your vision. That messes with your food cost, right? And you know, one tablespoon of dry, one more tablespoon of dried oregano, probably not that big a deal, but it certainly affects the outcome, the taste at the end of that dish. So making sure that these are that these exist and they're being followed is is really important. Um, these are some calculations that we run into when working with recipes uh, that you may need to use uh, as a teaching moment with your staff, um, and then. The last bit of this um, goes through a lot of recipe calculations. Um, and I will say, yes, this is a part that is difficult to translate um, in a virtual platform. So some of these may uh, be applicable, some may not. There is a large list um, here, right? Um, so I'll go through a few and, um, and then as has been mentioned, uh, the slides are available. Um, and then my email is at the end of the slideshow and I'm happy to answer any questions if you've got something specific for your operation. So let's look at um, as purchase cost. So as purchased, what did we pay for the thing that we got? The number of units that we got out of it, that's the as purchase cost per unit. Right? That one's pretty easy. That's the same as um, yield, right? So, um, or, yeah, how do we get yield? Well, what's our portion size? How many do we get out of a batch of lasagna, right? That's the, the individual portion. So, um, like I said, a lot of these, these all absolutely work. Um, some of them may be uh, what you're looking for for your operation. Let's see here on the next page. Um, so, uh, all right. 
dividing uh, the serving size by the edible, edible yield percentage, um, this will tell you how much raw product you need per serving. So what that means is if you're losing, um, meat is a decent example, you're using, losing some meat through trim, right? Um, if you need six ounces, uh, but your yield percentage is 75%, you need to start with eight ounces in order to get six ounces finished product, right? So if you're using water content, cutting off fat or, or silver skin, something like that. Um, Dividing the number of guests by the number of edible servings per raw pound. This will give you the amount of raw roast beef that you need to, to order or to requisition, right? So 110 servings divided by two would give us 55 raw pounds, right? Um, <clears throat> these are some more um, percentages um, and some of these uh, uh, formulas that are that kind of tie into the, to the ones on the previous slides. Um, so edible portion quantity divided by portion size gives us the number of servings, right? Um, and then last, there is um, some recipe conversion stuff. And then there is, uh, again, a, a little refresher on what should I be selling this thing for? Um, Another quick way, and I don't know if I mentioned this when we were talking specifically about menu price, is, um, is to multiply everything by three. So what that means is if you have $5 in raw food cost, if you multiply that by three, that gets you to $15. That's about what you should be charging for that thing. Again, following that 30% food cost, 30% labor, 30% overhead, 10% profit model. Uh, 30, 30, 30, 10. That gets you in the ballpark, right? Um, if, but that's not the end of it, right? That's real easy to get, right? Five times three, 15 bucks. And a lot of people, that's as far as they go. I will say that, again, taking into account um, what will the market bear and then really figuring out uh, and doing the math, raw food cost divided by the, the desired percentage, that'll give you the, the true accurate menu price. So I think it's all three of those things. What will we charge? What will the menu bear? Or, hmm, what will the market bear? Doing the actual math here and then multiplying the raw food cost times three, right? That gives you the most input, the most information about what you should be charging. So, um, so I'll go ahead and stop sharing here in a moment. Um, if there are any questions, my email is gabe at localfirstaz. I'm happy uh, to field those questions, or I'm sure uh, the folks from ACA would be happy to connect you with me um, or to answer any questions that they might be able to answer to walk you through some of those um, formulas, because I know they get a little um, confusing, particularly again in a virtual environment. So, all right. All right, great presentation, Gabe. I appreciate that. Um, so let's, we got a few minutes left that we can take for some questions. So please uh, post up your questions in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. Um, I, I was real interested, in, like you mentioned about the recipes and having that standard fair, you know, standard uh, method of work. Um, cause that's something, you know, all businesses should be applying. So, you know, different jobs, people can follow that same, same job description, you know, same recipe for success. Sure. Uh, we've had a Chris Ronzio from a uh, train you on before. And that's one of the things this company does. Yeah. Uh, he's been a great partner of ours and he's, he's created a company that helps businesses, you know, create that standard methodology. We so, uh, train you it. So yeah, they're, it's, they, it absolutely, they absolutely work. So, um, yeah. Um, are there any questions in the chat? No, there's no questions in the chat or in the Q&A box yet, but uh, we got a number of attendees on. So please, please ask if your questions for Gabe. Um, sure. You mentioned about the um, standardized recipes. I, I worked at a catering uh, company not long after I graduated from culinary school. It's kind of my first real kitchen management job. And uh, they had this binder with these standardized recipes that were a thousand years old, probably or something. But and but it had things like um, one can of tomato paste, but 
it didn't say what size can or how many ounces the can. And then you were to fill the can with water and then add that, we were making marinara sauce or something. And uh, so they were wildly out of date. And so I bring that up to say like, if you've written standardized recipes, but you've been in business for seven years and they're, they don't make sense anymore, then maybe it's time to revise. Awesome. Thank you. Um, what are some options? One of the things that, uh, you know, we're hearing just in, in general are supply chain issues, people not being able to get their supplies from the normal vendors. Um, what have you seen that can help some of the restaurant industry when, this, when they're facing this with maybe a standard vendor to have? Um, the supply chain, as I see it, I mean, you're, is that folks who are using broadline suppliers like Shamrock, um, Cisco, U.S. Foods, those vendors have had supply chain disruption issues um, because they're bringing in food from, frankly, all over the globe. And so there's all sorts of, you know, whether it be uh, uh, climate change or um, transportation issues, those types of things, right? Uh, crop loss. If you shift, even if as a backup, you're shifting to a local source for something like lettuce, um, then you wind up, one, having another option, but two, you usually wind up with a better product and they're much less affected, right, by something like uh, distribution. So if you're buying lettuce from Paulden, Arizona, like there's not a whole lot that will stop them from driving, you know, to the restaurant and delivering that lettuce. Thanks. We do have a question in the Q and A. It says, "How can you easily explain the differences in ounces and fluid ounces to newer kitchen employees?" <laughs> Man, if I had a dollar for every time I've been asked that. Um, The way that I did it in the culinary school was I got out a digital scale and I used something that this that had a very heavy viscosity like honey or heavy cream. And I would weigh, you know, I would in, on a volume measure, I'd do four ounces and then we'd set it on the scale and you realize that it's more than four ounces, right? So, it, but water, it won't work with water because water is, is the same. So you've got to do something um, that they can visually see was the only way that I could ever get it across to students. That's a great question, then. Excellent. We have another question that says, notice how you were saying that it made sense for restaurants to buy local organic salad fixings, but not onions for soup. Makes sense. Salad is something we focused on in the past, one in a different state. Now we are in a more rural area with mainly burger types of restaurants. As a farmer that will be growing produce, which items do you think are best to focus on for selling to restaurants? Hmm. So as I understand it, uh, this person is a farmer and they're trying to connect to restaurants. Um, <clears throat> I think the same advice that I would give to a restaurant, which is to focus on what you do really, really well. So if you can grow the most amazing snap peas or, you know, really fantastic watermelon, then, you know, go with your strengths. And there is a market out there for those things. I'll also say that by building partnerships with restaurants who quite frankly care um, and are willing to highlight your business as a means of telling the story of their business, you'll be best served. Excellent, thank you. All right, uh, doesn't matter we have any other questions. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up a few minutes early, give everybody about five minutes back to their day. Uh, if you have lots of meetings today, then it'll give you a little break to take care of business before you hit your next meeting. So you can refill your, your coffee or your favorite beverage or whatever you need to do. But uh, we want to thank everybody for being with us today uh, on this Tuesday. We want to thank Gabe for his time and his expertise on this subject. Um, hopefully this can help uh, all of our restaurateurs that uh, attended improve their business and take back, uh, you know, something that will help you gain more profit in your business. So thank you for attending. Uh, thank you for participating and, and Gabe, thank you for your presentation. And with that, we'll wrap up and we will see you on Thursday morning. Have a great day. Thanks, y'all.